of the energy levels of the electron. We call our line shape g of nu, or you can call it g of lambda, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use nu here. Um, and this is something we need to remember because this is going to give essentially a lot of information about our laser process. And essentially what it measures in fluorescence that we've been talking about, the, the photons that are emitted when an electron falls from an upper level to a lower level, is that's just proportional to the amount of light that's given off in this transition. And of course, we can define a full width half maximum or a width of this transition, a width of G nu. And I use the term FWHM to mean full width half maximum. And you've covered that in your previous optics class. So if we take a look at this, if we look at the total amount of light and the number of photons from the transition, that's essentially a, a total number of photons. And this mathematically is represented by the number of photons or equivalently power at each wavelength integrated over all the wavelengths. So the total number of photons is essentially the area underneath the curve because it turns out that at the, the more red wavelengths we have a certain number of photons that happen to fall within that frequency range. At the, the peak, the more sort of central wavelengths, we happen to have a larger number of photons because this area is larger that falls in that wavelength or frequency range. And over on the the shorter wavelength or larger frequency and we have another number of photons that falls in that frequency range. But the total is just given by the integral of the curve and essentially what you've got then is some constant multiplied by the line shape. We can simply break the number of photons into some constant that represents the number of photons multiplied by this line shape function. The line shape again remember is just the probability that an electron can do that transition and is proportional to the number of states you have available and equivalently we can represent this in terms of frequency rather than wavelength. I happen to like wavelength because that's what we usually measure in but you can do this in frequency e equally well. Again, G of nu is known as the line shape and this is an important point so pay attention to this. The integral of the line shape over all frequencies is equal to 1 because the line shape gives the probability that there will be a transition at a particular frequency, but because a transition occurs at some frequency, the integral over all the frequencies is unity. The probability is 100% or 1 that there will be a transition because we've said there's going to be. And so the integral of the line shape is equal to 1, and essentially that means this constant P we put out here is simply equal to the total number of photons. And that allows us to calculate the amount of power or the number of photons in a given spectral range by doing an integral between two particular frequencies. And so if you want to know how much power falls between frequency 1 and frequency 2, you just do this integral, and then you can pull out the total number of photons because that's essentially independent. And it turns out to be just the integral of the line shape. So the line shape simply gives us a probability that a transition will occur or we will see light of some particular frequency, wavelength, or color. And the larger the value of the line shape at this means we have a higher probability of seeing that photon, let's go ahead and erase all of this stuff, higher probability of seeing that photon, then we do this photon, and we have a higher probability still of seeing a photon or measuring power at this particular wavelength or color of light. And that's all given by the line shape function. It's just a function that says how the wavelengths are distributed over frequency. Great. Now let's see how this idea causes problems for us. Uh, we remember the idea of spontaneous emission, absorption, and stimulated emission as the three processes that occur in a material as the material interacts with light. And we recall that the spontaneous emission just means that somehow we put an electron up in this upper level and it falls back down and emits a photon. The photon can come out from these atoms in our block of material in pretty much any direction and can come out with pretty much any color determined by the probabilities given by this line shape. And we can write a differential equation that looks like this. Uh, absorption is the process of light coming in exciting the atoms and fewer photons coming out. We essentially move our electrons into our upper states through absorption. And we can write a differential equation that looks like that for that. And notice now here we'd say, look, all this differential equation depends on is the number of atoms that are in state two and some rate constant, A. However, in absorption, it depends on the number of atoms that are in state one 
some constant, the Einstein coefficient E12, as well as the energy distribution of photons. And the problem is we've got a function of frequency right there because the photons can't have some kind of frequency distribution. Stimulated emission is the opposite of absorption where you have a few photons coming in and a large number of photons going out like that. Um, and this one photon causes photons of the same color and going in the same direction to be emitted. And it's just the opposite of the absorption process. And again, it depends on the distribution of photons, the energy distribution of photons, which is frequency dependent. So let's see what this does to the system of differential equations. Because we are dealing with a range of frequencies. We know that not all colors of light are going to be the same. The wavelengths or frequencies of the light that come out are going to have some distribution given by this line shape. Um, that means we now have to write, um, and excuse me, this is a leftover. That shouldn't be there. That will, I'll probably have to cross those off of all of this. But our differential equations now depend on an energy distribution of N2 because that's at different states. It turns out that this factor is equal to 1, and we can effectively ignore it, which is good. But our differential equations for absorption um, now we can't ignore the integral because our photons have some kind of energy distribution. And so now we're sol stuck with the problem of solving a set of differential equations that contain definite integrals. And you see the same thing for the stimulated emission, where I can ignore this legacy term that got left on that I put in by mistake. Um, and again, we've got the problem of doing an integral uh, derivative that has an integral inside it. Fortunately, there's an approximation we can make. And this is where the idea of chapter 6, or longitudinal modes, comes back in. We know that our gain medium is inside a cavity. And so this is the block of material with the atoms the light's interacting with. We know that we've got some fairly reflective mirrors around this, so we don't have a laser. And we know that only certain frequencies are allowed inside this cavity. So if you look at the frequency distribution, it doesn't look like the green line anymore. Only certain very narrow ranges of frequency are allowed. And if we select one of those frequencies, then we can make the following approximation, which is vital to be able to deal with this, how a laser works. And this approximation is not always valid, but it, we're going to be using this in this class. And that is, we're going to assume the distribution of frequencies, delta nu, approaches zero. Because we know that these lines, we've already calculated in class, that they're extremely narrow. And so given the approximation, the distribution of frequencies approaches zero, we start off with our integral going between two frequencies. And we can say, hey, guess what? Um, these two frequencies are so close together, we're going to call it nu naught, just one frequency. And so we just substitute that in there. And instead of um, there being a line shape, we basically have a line shape times a delta function because it looks like that. <coughs> And then we, and we go ahead and do this integral. We know the integral of a delta function is equal to 1. And now we can substitute the energy density at some given frequency times the line shape at some given frequency for all these bloody integrals.